I am uh, Jim McCarthy, a professor of biological oceanography at Harvard University, but first, that's not why I'm here tonight. I'm here tonight in my capacity as chairman of the Board of Directors for the Union of Concerned Scientists. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this town hall meeting, New England's nuclear power plants, are we any safer after Fukushima? As many of you know, the Union of Concerned Scientists, which was founded right here at MIT in 1969, is a leading science-based nonprofit working for a healthy environment and safer world. UCS combines independent scientific research and citizen action. Our mission is to develop innovative, practical solutions. We work to secure responsible change, changes in government policy, corporate practices, and consumer choices. We work on a range of important and timely issues, including climate change, clean energy solutions, nuclear weapons, and global security, scientific integrity, food and the environment, and the subject of tonight's forum, nuclear power. For decades, UCS has worked to educate policymakers and the public about nuclear power. We advocate for increased safety and security of the U.S. nuclear power plants. UCS experts have testified before Congress, provided safety instructions to the, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff, appeared on national television and radio programs to offer our scientifically grounded perspective that will help shape better policy. UCS neither supports nor opposes nuclear power and we generally do not take positions regarding relicensing of individual plants. After last year's nuclear disaster in Fukushima, Japan, we decided to devote more resources to improve the safety and security of our own nation's 104 operating nuclear plants. The primary research, the primary focus of this effort is the policies and practices of our Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC which has oversight over the operation of all the nuclear power plants in the United States. The NRC is responsible for ensuring that the public is as safe and secure as possible. Our goal is to ensure that the NRC does its job exceedingly well. The public should expect no less. Toward this goal, we've expanded our state-level public education and advocacy work in a number of states, including here in New England. We're reaching out to state and local policymakers who have a critical role regarding public health and safety in their communities and have powerful voices in Washington. We believe that the NRC should move forward swiftly with necessary reforms to solve real safety problems. We're urging that these local policymakers use their influence with members of Congress and the President, both of whom have oversight over the NRC. Our success depends upon their leadership and upon citizens like all of us gathered here this evening. We need to help educate and engage our elected officials, our governors, state legislators, city councilors, mayors, and members of Congress. Tonight's forum is an important part of our nuclear power education and advocacy work here in New England. We hope you'll find the discussion both informative and solution-oriented. And we hope that you'll gain a better appreciation for how the resources of UCS can be used effectively. We see this as an opportunity to meet with other local advocates and learn from each other, how to better argue for increased nuclear power safety in our own communities. We hope you'll help keep us informed of your own local efforts. And we'd like, to send along, we'd like you to send along intelligence about your local activities. We want to hear your suggestions as how we can more effectively deal with local and state policymakers and with the media. Several members of our staff are here tonight, and they also will welcome the chance to meet and to work with you. So I'm pleased to introduce the moderator for this evening's event, Bruce Gellerman. Bruce is senior correspondent and host of Public Radio International's Living on Earth. He is a seasoned journalist who is knowledgeable in a wide range of issues, including nuclear power, I'm very pleased that he's agreed to moderate this town hall. And I now turn the program over to Bruce. Thank you, and good evening. I'm a journalist. I think it's a euphemism for old. Um, let me remind you, if, uh, if you haven't already, please turn off your cell phones or down uh, so that they don't ring or buzz. Or do what you do. It was uh, 
26 years ago exactly today that Chernobyl happened. And it was 33 years ago, last month, that Three Mile Island happened. And it was, of course, a year and a month ago that Fukushima Daiichi happened. And uh, but I have a problem every time I'm reporting these things because I keep on saying there were accidents. And sometimes I'll resort to disasters. But, you know, it doesn't, first of all, they weren't accidents. And disasters doesn't, you know, it's like, whoops, spill that. It's, I, I, they're a failure of imagination. Who could have imagined these, these, this series of weird events happening, both human and technological? So, ah, I think it's for you, Ray. <laughs> you know, who could, who could conceivably imagine these things? And yet, we have to imagine these things because that's the job of the NRC. At least they have to. And it's the job of me to report on them, and it's the report of these three major or four major influence on the side of the NRC to make sure that they do have the imagination to do their jobs. So tonight, what we're going to do, it's my job, and it's basically timekeeper and facilitator. To, I'll tell you the format, and I'm going to keep these thorns uh, in their respective time places, and we'll move it, the conversation around. We're going to have a short introduction from each one in their turn, and then we'll have a general discussion back and forth, and I'm going to invite you at that point to get involved in the conversation. Okay, and I'll come to you with a, a, a microphone. I'm going to ask that you please keep your remarks short and sweet. No soapboxing and no pontificating. We really are here to exchange ideas and, and learn from each other, okay? So, with that, let me introduce uh, very briefly each one. I'll just give their name and a little bit of their identification, and, and then in their turn, I will give a more uh, broad uh, uh, understanding of their backgrounds. So we have Mary Lampert. Mary? There's Mary. And uh, Mary's involved in uh, Ogram. Debbie Grinnell. Hello, Debbie. She's involved in Seabrook. Ray Shattis is involved with Vermont Yankee uh, and Seabrook. And of course, David Lockdown, who's the director of UC as his nuclear safety uh, project. Let's start with uh, Debbie. You look like mine. I, I, I know Debbie briefly because we met and I did a story with her help. And she is unbelievable. Yeah. I don't know if, you, if anyone knows Debbie here. But one woman against an entire nuclear power plant. And I'm not sure which generates more energy. <laughs> Mary Lampert is the founder and director of Pilgrim Watch, a nonprofit organization that serves the public interest on issues regarding Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station located in Plymouth, Massachusetts. The organization's focus is solely on achieving measures to better protect public health and safety. Mary represents Pilgrim Watch Pro Se in the adjudication process regarding Energy's license application to extend operation at Pilgrim to 2032. Uh, let me just stop there. How old would uh, Pilgrim be in 2032? You'd be 60. Okay. 10 years younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> the legal proceedings began in 2006 and is going on to this very day the longest fight in relicensing in the country. Mary's been very active in her community of Duxbury, Massachusetts, which is just a short way from the power station. I think you can almost see it from your house, if I remember correctly. Um, and she's uh, chaired the town-appointed Nuclear Advisory Committee for two decades. Mary Lambert. So, Mary, we have three or four minutes here just to tell us what your major issues are, your perspective on Pilgrim and vis-a-vis -vis the NRC. Um, um, we started out with the introduction saying Union of Concerned Scientists' focus is to have the Nuclear Regulatory Commission do their job. NRC, uh, to me, stands for, at present, no real concern. No real concern for our safety, but considerable concern for the bottom line. Nor do they have concern for their own their rules for licensing. Just this week, the NRC staff has asked the commission to pick the winner, Andrew G., and call the relicensing game over, although all the players are still on the field, which means a precedent 
that they can call Seabrook tomorrow if, in fact, the commission goes forward. There are a lot of safety concerns in Pilgrim. The orders that have been issued to the fiddle around the edges and do not get at the heart and the meat of the problem. So, in Fukushima happened here, at Pilgrim Station, you bet. Unless the regulators decide to regulate for a change, which means political action by us, and the rules, they don't just have to enforce them, they have to make some more rules to adjust to what we have learned. If we don't learn from yesterday's mistakes, we are bound to repeat them, and the consequences are simply too great. Let me ask you, Mary, very briefly here. Uh, the Pilgrim plant is the same model, same type of reactor as in Fukushima? Yes, and, and that is the case also for Vermont Yankee. And these reactors are, in my opinion, an accident waiting to happen unless serious fixes are addressed, which I'm afraid would cost too much money. That's what I'm afraid of. And I do not believe, or has not, have not seen indication to date that the NRC has shown the interest in requiring the fixes that are necessary. Now I sound, maybe I've had a black cloud over my head for too long, but we're here to have an honest discussion. Let me ask a follow-up question briefly. Uh, am I right or wrong? There are more extent nuclear fuel rods in spent fuel tanks in Pilgrim than there are in Fukushima? Uh, Fukushima had uh, about 1,500. Pilgrim's pool was designed for 880. They currently have 3,200. And Energy has no intention of getting that pool back as it should be to low density open frame Design, they only intend to take out the requisite number to squeeze in the next download, unless required to do so. And what would be the consequences according to studies by the Attorney General if, in fact, there were a fire, if water was lost? Up to 480 billion dollars and 24 latent cancers, 480,000 billion dollars. That's how much he estimated. Let's turn to Ray Shannis. Ray Shannis, in 1979 and 1980, together with his wife Pat, led the nation's first initiative referendum to close an operating nuclear power station. That was the one at Maine Yankee, the plant that was just eight years in operation. In 1995, Ray founded Friends of the Coast Opera opposing nuclear pollution, which was instrumental in closing the main Yankee, and directly involved in the plant's decommissioning. Today, Ray serves as a consulting technical advisor to the Vermont-based New England Coalition on Nuclear Pollution, which has been around for like 40 some odd years, right? Since 1971. And it's the only uh, intervener to engage in litigation on both the state and federal levels in, on the Vermont Yankee's uh, licensing. He's presently uh, representing both friends of the coast and he sees the sole interviews in the Seabrook nuclear license, uh, station to be licensed. Mr. Schneider. Floor is yours. Well, Seabrook. I was hired in uh, 1997 um, by New England Coalition. I had been a trustee for many years, but I was hired on as a uh, technical advisor and tasked with um, ferreting out safety issues and environmental issues at uh, New England's nine nuclear stations um, and then uh, finding means to address those issues, whether through litigation or um, through attempting to coerce the Nuclear Regulatory Commission into doing its job or in the various state regulatory venues. At that time, um, 
We had one uh, nuclear, one of the nine nuclear stations, Millstone One, uh, in Safe Store. In other words, Mothball. It's a multi-unit site, and uh, it really doesn't pay to decommission and try to clean them up radiologically. Uh, if you have other plants operating on site, and uh, as we call it technically, cracking up the site. So um, that one was closed. Uh, the Yankee Row, which was the darling of the Eisenhower Adams for Peace program, uh, was also closed. Um, UCS and New England Coalition had uh, focused public and regulatory attention on the fact that its uh, reactor vessel, the great iron cauldron that holds the nuclear fuel, um, was embrittled by neutron bombardment. Um, their, their own experts uh, in testimony said that if they ever had to turn on their emergency core cooling system, it was likely that the reactor vessel would fracture like glass. Um, Maine Yankee um, <clears throat> had shut down, was going into decommissioning. Connecticut Yankee had shut down and was going into decommissioning. Um, all of the plants in New England that at that time had shut down and were either in safe store or in decommissioning had been shut down in advance of the end of their license lifetime. Um, so the outliers at this point are Pilgrim and Vermont Yankee, where the intent is to run the plants beyond the end of their license lifetime. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission's position is that uh, the 40-year lifetime was really chosen because of financial interests um, and that it really bore no relationship to the uh, aging factors or condition of the reactors themselves, which is, of course, not true. Um, when the originally 35-year license, then advanced to 40-year license was decided upon, um, the builders, owner-operators of those reactors, went out and ordered parts, substantial parts, uh, with a 40-year design length. So Vermont Yankee's reactor vessel, for example, was certified by its builder, Chicago Bridge and Iron, uh, for a 40-year uh, design length. Um, and if you look down through the full spectrum of of components, systems, structures, and components in these plants, you find that um, a major portion of the plant has a 40-year design life. So we're, we're in essence now, uh, since March, whatever, 27th, 2012, over in Vermont, we're running on borrowed time. Um, the, the, other, the other thing besides relicensing that the industry undertook uh, that in the uh, mid-1980s, when they realized that there were going to be no new reactor licenses, uh, in order to resuscitate the industry, they, they basically got together with NRC and said, how can we squeeze more power longer out of these reactors for a longer period? And uh, so the the answer, of course, was relicensing. Let's run them longer. Um, and then also, is there any margin for running them with more heat, more heat energy, more fuel? Burn more fuel. You set, you create more heat, you create more steam, you get more power out of them. Can we increase the, the efficiency of them in any way? And uh, that led to the process called power upgrades. Um, both Pilgrim and Seabrook have minor power upgrades. Uh, Vermont Yankee uh, was granted, uh, over our strenuous objections, a 20% power upgrade. Um, 
So that's kind of what we're faced with. Uh, we have a company with a extremely loose uh, corrective action program with a very, very poorly done maintenance program. Um, the cooling tower structures at Vermont Yankee, for example, uh, were certified for 50 years of life. This is a, a cooling tower institute approximation of how long they would last. Well, they they fell down a few years ago. Literally, literally began to fall apart because the entire structure is. Uh, I'm sorry, it's what it is. It's twisting slowly in the wind, uh, which. In their case, undid a five-foot diameter uh, header pipe within the cooling towers and dumped a humongous amount of water on the uh, cooling tower deck and collapsed uh, one whole section of it. It's um, interesting that you used that expression. Who was it that said it sh would shatter like a, a glass? This this was actually an NRC staffer in the in the proceeding. Well, it's on that. really interesting because Westinghouse has a new design for a reactor called the AP1000, which is a new generation of passive reactor, passive safety reactors, which the chief I, I can't remember his name, Dr. Lee, I think, of the NRC, just said last year that it would shatter like a glass club cup. Those are the exact words. So there's nothing new under the sun. What's wrong with a design that has a swimming pool on the roof? I want to know. I mean, so, Holiday Inn could uh, do well to uh, emulate the <laughs> nuclear industry on that one. The so passive we, design, by the way, has to be triggered. And we haven't talked about, you mentioned the trigger. I mean, we haven't talked about uh, the state's lawsuit and all that. We'll get into that. Uh, Debbie Grinnell, and we're going up the coast. To, uh, she serves as the research manager and was a founding board member of the C10 Foundation based in Newburyport, Massachusetts, which was formed as a direct result of the NRC's issuing the Seabrook Station a license to be operating in 1990. C10 was initially formed as a watchdog group to monitor the health and safety impact of Seabrook's operation as a primary mission, but in the absence of this, I just found out today, I didn't know this, in the absence of either federal or state real-time radiation monitoring systems, they stepped in and created their own system to monitor the, the, the area. They did test before, the, before it went, uh, started, and they've continued today. So today, they have 20 years of radiation level database with 16 computerized monitoring sites for future study. C10 also monitors Seabrook's on-site operational issues and the NRC inspections of Seabrook to investigate all serious plant issues and advocate for public safety. And they bring out local. Thank you. Sure. I, I'd like to begin by thanking UCS for including the C10 Foundation, all of us, in this important discussion. <clears throat> C10 uh, is a peculiar story in that although the plant went online in 1990, the plant was built under a structural code from 1965. The plant was actually under construction in the 70s. And a great deal of the construction work was um, curtailed, it was stopped. Um, there were uh, several utilities involved, and um, we had some bankruptcy issues. So the concern over the um, actual construction at Seabrook has always been something that our group has tracked and maintained the records from the construction period. And also, there was an employee legal project with several uh, whistleblower allegations that were very well investigated. They were investigated independently through a very credible uh, technology group. And also, the NRC was then required to um, substantiate the allegations. So this is a plant that began operation in, in 1990, has now requested a license renewal very prematurely to 2050, when we know that there have been long-term issues um, at Seabrook, and one of which um, has never been abated and continued right from 
the start of construction. Seabrook is built in a salt marsh, salt marsh, and it had huge issues with water infiltration, groundwater infiltration during the concrete pours. And um, they devised uh, dewatering wells and a protective membrane, which through the documentation we know was uh, ruptured before the plant even went online. And when they abandoned the dewatering wells at the point of um, actually moving into the buildings, the groundwater went through the um, cement. So in the 1980s, in, the in 1983, um, they had companies come in and repair the concrete with something called Bandex CP compound. No one really knew um, how long these would last or how far the crystalline uh, gel would, would move through the concrete. And the NRC deemed this an, an um, unresolved safety issue in the 1980s. We now have a plant in the year 2012 who has a new finding that is severe and extensive, and it involves the concrete. And um, it's not a huge surprise to us after 30 years of groundwater infiltration that there's an early deterioration of Seabrook's foundation. In the last year and a half, it has now blossomed from a concern for a safety related building that was a seismic category one building, the control building, can't operate a plant without it. And um, an electrical ball that carried the cables that are for emergency feed water, which is certainly critical. It then blossomed into realizing that all of the um, power block buildings, the containment building, the waste processing building, the diesel generator building, the um, buildings that are all very closely connected were all affected at the foundation. So this has become a serious problem, and um, it, it has been um, interesting to watch the NRC's response to this, because when NextEra, the owners of Seabrook, applied for their application, they did not inform the NRC that they already knew they had confirmed testing of ASR concrete in their control building. And the tests had come back and reflected that there was a 21% decrease in the compression strength of the concrete and a 47% decrease in the elasticity. How did you find that? So, How did you find that? Did you find that out or did the NRC tell you? We, we found it out much later. But I, I think it's critical to know the timeline here because, in actuality, Seabrook applied for a relicense knowing this condition but not including it into their application. And this is a clear violation of federal law. This is a violation of 10 CFR 50.9. Um, they are to submit a full and complete application identifying all adverse conditions in their plan to manage them. So they not only didn't include it in their application, they also did not include it immediately into a structural monitoring program. And then we found out subsequently that there were a great many things that were never monitored in the structural monitoring program for the last 20 years. So we um, now have a plan that has a condition. We don't know the genesis. We don't know the extent. We don't know the rate. And so we're looking to see what the NRC is doing about this. And what we find is that, unfortunately, as it's a new discovery in the industry, the industry has notified all nuclear plants, all 103 of our nuclear plants, that there's this new condition but that we don't have in our guidance at the NRC any technical basis or guidance to know what to do with it. We also have an industry that the nuclear industry does not have guidance on this. So 
we're really looking for solutions and whatever the industry is projecting as a solution is now having to be very carefully considered by the NRC because the standards that have been used for concrete have largely been used for the actual construction phase, for the pour and the mixes that are used in construction and the ways to mitigate um, aggregates that might be forming in them. So next era, which owns and operates the right. What has been the sanctions from the NRC or fines for their failure to report the ASR concrete issue during their application? They the did not. They did not cite them for the violation of not including it in their application, and it's been sort of carefully, uh, you know, concealed in terms of the timeline. What they have done is cite the plant because they were. Um, obligated to show with this degraded condition that the plant was operable and that it was not affecting the structural integrity of the buildings. And in doing the, those calculations, um, the NRC questioned a year after they were done, after the plant told them that, that the plant was operable and they were operating within design basis, that the calculations were flawed and they asked for internal help. The NRC asked their technical division to um, look carefully at the calculations, found them flawed, and to our surprise, we found that NextEra did not use the degraded concrete, which was the purpose of doing an operability determination on structural integrity. They used concrete that was not degraded in their calculations, and there were several other criteria that they did not include. So this was a very incompetent um, and cited. The NRC did cite them for this. But they cited them for um, a very low, insignificant safety finding because they did it late. And then when they did it, they did it wrong. And um, I, I'm sad to say that I've just been to Washington to attend an NRC hearing on this. And although they have researchers who are struggling with the proposals that NextEra is, is providing them for testing and um, to find solutions to develop replicas so they can see if they can try to figure out what the rate of progression would be. They're not under federal code. So we really have a, a uh, regulatory body that's struggling internally with their own research staff to come up with, and they're certainly tapping other industries to try to come up with criteria. And they're, and they're also in a position of not being able to judge whether the industry solutions are, um, because there are no standards, are going to be adequate. So we should say, we, though, that the NRC finally tonight, after many requests, I think, Congressman Markey had a request, a meeting, the town hall meeting uh, at Seabrook tonight. Mm -hmm. That is happening, am I right? Yes, uh -huh. it is happening. Let me introduce David Block, their power experts. He's director of the UCSC, UCS's nuclear safety project. He monitors ongoing safety issues at U.S. reactors, which there are four. Testifies before Congress and the NRC Commission and occasionally talks to people like me uh, and tells me what I need to know about things nuclear. Um, he is a nuclear engineer by training. David worked at the nuclear power plants for 17 years, including many of the, the uh, GE Mark I type reactors that was at the Fukushima plant. He left the industry in the early 1990s after blowing the whistle on unsafe practices and joined UCS in 1986. He then left for a year in 2009 to work for the NRC uh, in Tennessee as a reactor technology instructor, and then came back to UCS. Today. He's the author of numerous reports, including the one uh, that was just came out about Fukushima. Uh, and uh, what was the exact title of that? I, I heard it down here. Oh, one year after Fukushima. Nuclear safety one year after Fukushima. There you go. David? Thank you, Bruce, and thank you for coming out and sharing this evening with us. I've had the pleasure of working for UCS in that role for over 15 years now. Bob Pollard, my predecessor, worked in that job for 15 or for 20 years, so I'm, I'm a rookie so far. We learned three things. I wanted to 
share three things we learned over those 35 plus years. We actually learned more than three things, but I wanted to share those three things I think are relevant to the discussion this evening. UCS complained a lot over those 35 years about safety problems at operating plants. Most of the time, when we were whining about a safety problem at some plant, it was because the safety regulations established by the new regulatory commission simply weren't being met. There were some times that we complained about something because we felt the safety levels were not sufficient and the safety standards needed to be raised to protect workers and the public. But most of the time, we were concerned because the NFC's own regulations simply weren't being met. An example of a safety regulation that's not being met are the NRC's fire protection regulations. They were adopted by the agency in May of 1980 as a result of a fire at the Browns Ferry plant in Alabama. That fire wiped out the cables for the safety systems on all the safety systems on Unit 1 and most of those safety systems on Unit 2. It was very heroic operator actions that day that prevented two meltdowns. More than three decades later, there are 47 reactors in the United States that don't meet those fire protection regulations, including the three reactors at Browns Ferry. An example of the other kind, where we figure the, the regulations are, are just not adequate to deal with the hazard, involves spent fuel storage at nuclear power plants, particularly those like Pilgrim. They're currently stored in spent fuel pools several floors above ground level in not very robust containment structures protected by one non-safety system with no backups other than luck, they can be easily taken out. There's more fuel in the spent fuel pools than is in the reactor core. It's protected by fewer barriers, fewer safety systems, and fewer tests and inspections. So that's a problem we figure the NFC is not doing enough about and <coughs> result you're at risk. In 1982, Pilgrim's owners had to sign a contract with the federal government for the federal government to take that fuel beginning in 1998. To date, under that contract, the federal government has collected billions of dollars of your ratepayer money. So far, they've accepted not a single fuel bundle from any plant anywhere. So they've taken your money and given you higher risk in return. That needs to be fixed. Second thing we learned was that plant owners don't necessarily sacrifice safety in order to boost their bottom line. What we found is just the opposite. The safest plants in the country, according to our analysis, are also the lowest cost electricity producers. The reason they do that is good management that keeps their eye on safety, which allows them to also keep a, a good control over the bottom line. So it's not a choice between safety and financials. It's a, it's a choice between safe, financially economical plants and unsafe, uneconomical plants. We don't know why anybody picks that second choice. The third thing we learned, I think you've seen some tonight, is that people can make a huge difference. Individuals can make a big difference in this, despite the resources disparity between the public and the plant owners. I've had the pleasure of working with Ray and Debbie and Mary for, for, for a long time. The first public appearance I ever made for UCS was November 13, 1996, at an event Ray had up in Maine. Yeah, up in Maine. Um, I've learned a little bit since then, but that was that was the beginning for me, and I've always appreciated that and working with Debbie and Mary as well. These people and others like them across the country who unselfishly work on these safety issues, they don't do it for money. They definitely don't do it for money. They don't do it for ego satisfaction. They do it for their families and their communities, and their, their efforts have paid dividends. They improve safety across the country time and again. So when Debbie or Mary or Ray contacts me for help, it's very, it's almost impossible to say no when they're working so unselfishly on so many people's behalf. It's also rewarding to me to work with them and achieve those outcomes. So in your report card at the year after Fukushima, you identified 15 near misses, two of them at Pilgrim, and one of them, in our conversation, I want you to repeat to the audience, because this was one of the power surge. What was happening? Pilgrim was restarting last year from a, a scheduled refueling outage. The operators were starting up the plant. In doing so, they, they would withdraw control rods, which are basically the brake on the nuclear engine. So they're slowly letting off the brake to allow the, the power output of the plant to slowly come up to speed. As they're doing that, they have to heat up the plant and the water that cools the reactors because it's relatively cold temperature. 
they can't heat up that water too fast for the problems that Ray alluded to. As metal expands and contracts due to temperature increases and decreases, it can become overstressed and break. So there's, a, there's a, a limit on how fast that water can increase. The operators withdrew some control rods, tried to pick up the power level. They saw the temperature rising according to, to a computer well above what that heat up rate was. So their corrective action was to reinsert the control rods. Now the power increase wasn't occurring at all. The temperature was staying stable, which doesn't help the startup. So they withdrew those control rods again and a few others. Now the power was doubling. The power of the reactor was doubling every 20 seconds. This is a 108 ton reactor core that's doubling every 20 seconds. I worked at Browns Ferry, which is a sister plant to Pilgrim, and I saw that reactor core double every five seconds for a short while. It's not pleasant. It's not something you try to do. They lost control of the reactor. And the safety systems automatically kicked in and tilted the machine, game over. The reactor automatically shut down and they had to try again. It's, I used to teach NRC inspectors reactor startups on a simulator like Pilgrim. These were instructors who hadn't received training. They were, they were going through the training the first time. And I didn't have those, those individuals make that book a year. Um, so it was very hard to believe that seasoned trained operators at Pilgrim would make such a foolish year. What they should have done when they pulled the control the first time was absolutely nothing. Because the, the heat, they had just withdrawn the control rods, power did go up for a short period of time, the temperature of the water did go up. But it, if they didn't continue moving control rods, it wouldn't increase at that same rate. They should have just sat back and done nothing. Uh, other what they did is it's nuclear power, hokey pokey, increase power, reduce power, increase power, lose control, game over. Um, and it's, it's baffling that they would do that in this day and age. So let me switch gears a little slightly and ask you a very quick question. NRC, is it better today, better equipped since Fukushima to deal and prevent these types of accidents, disasters, or worse? What is it? Well, it's, it's a hard one. They're better in many respects. The, the task force report that came out of the NRC's own task force last June identified 34 things to reduce the vulnerability of a Fukushima type accident in the United States. For the most, we have a few things here and there we'd like to add to that, but for the most part, that's a very solid list of things to reduce vulnerabilities of U.S. reactors. That's on the plus side. The downside of that is the pace at which they make those reforms. Safety IOUs protect no one. So until those lessons learned are actually implemented behind us, instead of on the road ahead, they can't get a, an A grade on just laying out a plan. It's the completion of that plan that will protect us. Uh, I have lots of questions, and I'm sure you do, so rather than me ask mine, I have you ask yours. Mike's not working. Um, okay. How would that yeah. work? Oh, ah, yeah. okay. So I'm going to come to you if you would like to ask a question. If you don't have questions, I have many. So I'll come to you. Let's see if I can stretch over to you. It's like my fill of dining. So I just have a, a quick question about the last thing you said. Why did they keep playing with the power up and down? Was it stupid? They didn't know any better? The operators are sick? I honestly don't know. Um, I've been in control rooms for dozens if not hundreds of startups. I saw that once and the operator who did that the reason that happened at Browns Ferry when I saw it happen in five seconds was they, the operators had shipped the ships. The new one who came in and took the understand the condition safe because he wasn't fully understanding what was going on and should have increased power level. The operators of Pilgrim had been there for a while. It's not real clear why they took the action that they did. The training doesn't tell them to do that. The procedures don't tell them to do that. So when they winged it, they crashed. I don't understand, having been there many, many times, I don't understand why that happened. That's why we rate that as one of the worst events last year because there's, there's really no call for that. That's a routine operation that they're trained for. These are the same individuals that will protect us in case of a severe accident. If you can't walk and chew gum, you can't run and juggle. So that, that, that event troubled us quite a bit because it shouldn't have happened. And nobody asked why they didn't have a good answer to that. Because, again, the procedures, their training, there's nothing. There's no real clear 
they believed the computer. They thought they were dealing with a problem that the reactor temperature was soaring too rapidly. I don't know of anybody that I've ever worked with or seen that would have made that mistake. No, I, th I think if they were lying, they would have come up with a much better story than that. So I, <laughs> I don't think that was it. Uh, so let's see, how am I going to get to you? So what do you think it is? I, th I think what happens is that reactors in the old days used to shut down eight to ten times a year. Nowadays they shut down maybe once every two years. So they're not as practiced on doing that as they used to be. They're supposed to supplement the real-time in the control room experience with control room simulator training. Somehow that's not working because they had more than one individual involved in that. Somebody should have stopped that from getting as bad as it was and it didn't happen. And it, there's no real good explanation for why they let that happen. Yes, it couldn't happen, but notice that you've got the title of scientist above all your heads. That title confers not only a great amount of respect to the public, but also a responsibility to the public, to the public. Not just to report rumors or hearsay or speculation, but, but to allow data, experiment, to be the judge of all knowledge. You point out some facts today that I would like to get some more details on. For, for example, you claim that Fukushima is going to result in 48,000 uh, more cancers in the Japanese. Yes, I would refer you to the Attorney General's expert report by Dr. That's hearsay. That's hearsay. That's hearsay. No, that's hearsay. no, no you, haven't read, that. you haven't read the report. The but, report is about 100 pages, okay. and I'd like yeah. to have 100 Would pages. Would you care to educate us on the report then? What was the ecological model in the report? What was the data that was responsible uh, for the extrapolation? They used the MACS2 code, uh, which number one is outdated according to uh, Commissioner uh, Apostolakis of MIT, number one. And also, according to David Shannon, who wrote the report for him, you can talk to him at Shannon uh, Consulting now dot, um, dot com, and he wrote the report for for both Mac S and Mac S2. Okay, I asked because okay. that represents an extraordinary claim, because according to the World Health Organization, an accident like Chernobyl, for example, which resulted in significantly more radiological releases, had only about no more than 6,000 deaths of cancer, and that, that was thyroid cancer. Now, I'm in, I'm in, I could be very well interested to hear what types of cancer those 48,000 are, but how do they, how do they really arrive at that 48,000 number? Because that's an extraordinary claim that runs against yeah. the rest of the scientific yeah, data we have at radiological exposure. But, you know, we could talk about this for a long time. Am I a scientist? No. Am I, and can I responsibly lead you to scientists who in fact have done these reports that you can see? Yes. I feel that the Massachusetts Attorney General is responsible. He stood behind his vulnerability analysis done by Dr. Gordon Thompson, showing the vulnerability in particular of loss of water from the overcrowded pool and how and why that is likely to lead to a fire. Step two was what would be the consequences. Dr. Jan B.A., for instance, did a consequence analysis using the MAC S2 code which is the standard code used, not required, but approved by the NRC, and with all its uh, lack of conservatism, and I say that based upon David Shannon, who wrote the code while at San Sofia and suggested you could talk to him, but using that code, he estimated, and all the data is in the report, of the likely consequences of the release 
of cesium-137. Okay, so that release, was it of greater or less of significance than it was released at Chernobyl? Can I uh, speak to that uh, Chernobyl thing? Yeah, yes. I've read. Oh, please do. There's a book that has been released. Um, but, but I'm telling you about a book that says there's 995,000 people that have died from Chernobyl. So um, there's the New York Academy of Science. Okay, that book is, has been met among the among the radiologic community. That book has been met with much skepticism. I think we, you know, to argue this point about how many deaths, we think is, 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 I, I find besides the point, to be honest with you, because these accidents weren't supposed to happen. That's the point. And whether, whether you can say 6,000 or 48,000 in the same breath, it's, it's um, what, what do you mean, is it a statistic? <coughs> well, the fact is that they weren't supposed to have a, a tidal wave and an earthquake, and these things weren't supposed to be submerged, and they were supposed to be a protective, and, the, and the, the, the container was supposed to hold the radiation, and they weren't. I mean, you can go on and on and on. And you can pick this stuff apart, and these are good questions. I'm not suggesting that it's not a good question. I don't think we're going to resolve it. It's a, it's a very legitimate question. If you go to the Atomic International Atomic Energy Agency, they will tell you a, it's that it, basically the effects of Chernobyl were not 6,000 deaths. It was radiophobia. That's their 25th anniversary conclusion of the major effect of Chernobyl. It was fear of radiation. Oh, I agree with that. But you're, you're doing a risk analysis here. To give the proper perspective on the risks involved with this plant, you have to talk numbers like the number of deaths we have per kilowatt hour. That's right, but the, the, the I think you have, up. as I said, I think, and I'm not going to argue with you, and I, and I don't want to turn this into this kind of dating society, I think you have a very legitimate question and it can be addressed. And, but to get this fine grain, I'm, I'm sorry, at this point, I think it's not helpful, to be honest. So let me just move I on here. Yeah, and like any other person that was on your program, so I just wanted to introduce myself. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask any of you um, about the... Um, the fact that there's a whole other seismic era that has dawned on the world. And we're having more uh, seismic activity and stronger seismic activity. And a lot of it is projected for the East Coast. Um, so there's that given now, um, and that's been documented. Um, and that there are these um, fire hazards with the cables that are submerged. There's the pipes that are leaking that they can't get to because they're built underneath the reactors. And you've got these GE Mark 1s with the seven-story high cooling pools. Um, and uh, the diesel generators usually last for four to eight hours or something like that. So given all of these things, is it possible to make these uh, GE Mark 1s uh, that are many of them very close to fault lines that are now being unearthed and discovered and, uh, and, and becoming active. Is it possible to make them safe? Good question. I would say yes. I would say yes. I would say yes. There, there are ways to deal with the spent fuel hazard. Just move the fuel out of the pools into dry cans. As far as the seismic hazard, the good news is that in the early 90s, the United States Geological Survey did identify that the seismic hazard in the central and eastern United States was greater than previously hazard, previously considered. In 1995, the NRC revised its regulations for plant owners dealing with seismic hazards. The earthquake in August of last year at the North Anna plant was below the, the ground motion level, the, the earthquake magnitude that North Anna Unit 3, the proposed new reactor North Anna, was going to be protected against. So that new hazard was translated into regulations that were applied to the new reactor. The flip side of that is that the two reactors at North Anna that were operating at the time were not designed for that hazard, as were 25 other reactors in the United States. The NRC took steps to protect reactors that weren't operating, but did nothing about the 27 reactors that were operating, and still hasn't done anything to this day about that. So I think this plant can be safe. The question is whether this Nuclear Regulatory Commission will take those steps to achieve that outcome. That I have some doubts about, but I don't have any doubts that you could make a, a reactor that can be operated safely. Sir, you have a question. Uh, uh, thanks for <coughs> allowing me to ask a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that the best run plants are also the safest, the ones that have the, the that are, um, you know, the 
the bottom line of money and, the, and safety coincide. By the same token, clearly from some of the other examples that have been brought up, um, some of these plants need some very serious, expensive repairs to make them safe. And presumably in the marketplace, there's, you know, pushback to do that because they want to make a profit. Um, and then you also mentioned the fact that the NRC isn't doing its job. And I keep hearing, you know, I, I in college, was an anti-nuclear activist. And I work in solar and renewable energy and conservation. Um, so, you know, I know that information from those sources is going to be slanted in one way. But fundamentally, if the, if the organizations that are supposed to be regulating are not doing their job, and the people with this potentially very dangerous technology are trying to hide expenses, it, it's, it's really worrisome. And, um, yeah, well, that is the question. What do we do about that? How, how do we know that we've ever got it right? Well, I, I pointed out where the NRC is not doing a good job, and I, I stand behind those statements. But the NRC also does a good job in some areas. It's not like they're the Keystone Cops. They mess up everything they get their hands on. For example, in December, in late 2010, the NRC inspectors at the Fort Calhoun plant in Nebraska found that that plant wasn't protected against floods the way it was supposed to be. The plant owner said, wait a minute, it's been like this for 30 years. That must be good enough. Thank you, but go away. The NRC listened to those arguments, but overrode them, compelled the plant owner to upgrade flood protection. That came in real handy in June of 2001 when flooding the Missouri River turned that into an island parked temporarily within the river. The gap that was identified the previous year was five years shortfall. The flooding went into that gap. So if the, if the things hadn't been protected, the outcome could have been much, much worse. That plant remained shut down today, even though the floodwaters receded, because there were a number of other problems that the NRC required to be fixed. So the NRC is not always the incompetent Sergeant Schultz messing anything up. In our reports, the last two years, we've identified areas where the NRC has made very good catches, like at Fort Calhoun, and that's not an isolated case. We've also pointed out times where they, they didn't do very well. The goal is to try to get them to emulate the good behavior more often and avoid the bad behavior more often also. And so, I, I would add that I think uh, the role then is for the public to not simply say no, that's easy, but rather also to look at today, identify what are the problems, prioritize them, such as at my reactor, the security is not at all adequate uh, from the water, and there is none from the air, address the problem, and then become active in trying to pressure and get change, whether it is through uh, the regu regulatory process, enforcement actions, whatever, working with Congress, and identify, for example, the direct source event, which is very important for our types of reactors. It's a problem. They are not filtered. They're with the rupture disk to make them act absolutely <coughs> passive. There are things, fixes, that are sensible, that can and should be done. And so I'm saying that the public, I, I will agree with Dave in the fact that you can make them a lot safer. You can reduce the risk, and that is worth the effort. And it will only happen if the people are politically active because it is going to be political pressure in a large measure that is going to bring about safer fixes and hence our, our safety. Will it has, has be Ray, over? No. The NRC, I'm going to ask for a short answer. The NRC is receptive to you. You just got that to me. Do you feel that the receptive, Ray, you've been before them, are they receptive? Have you seen a change to, to citizen action? Honestly. Well, I'll give you an example. We wrote a petition for rulemaking when Seabrook was 
uh, beginning their process of investigation into spent fuel canisters and what, where to go, Ghostbusters, you know, which one are we going to use? So we did research at the same time. And what we found was that the casts were going to be there longer than 20 years, maybe 100 years, and there's speculation that they'd be there, but that they're only qualified for 20 years. So <clears throat> we spent about a year looking at all the issues in and around um, dry cast storage because we had 911. We knew this was the way to go. We needed to get the the fuel that was possible to move out, out for safety. And yet, we were looking at the, the requirements at the NRC for dry cast storage, and they were lacking in technical specs and, and design. So did the NRC so, respond positively, negatively, so, or not at all? Well, it's a good story. So in 2007, we wrote a petition for rulemaking. It was accepted, which is rare. And so I will tell you that I have called once a month since 2008, and I have a record. And when I call, I have yet another answer. One of them was that UCS had managed to put it on their website, and Haas was part of the um, recommendations that they made. And so there were a thousand responses. So. The first excuse was there were way too many responses. It was going to take months to go through. So we are now in 2012, and every month I call and and I write down their response. And it was well now we need management buy-in. There there is something really wrong with the molasses that the in this bureaucracy because. They accepted it and said it was substantially rich. These were largely issues that I spent a lot of time with NRC uh, researchers vetting the information, going to ASME standard consensus board people and doing the best I could as a layperson to zero in on these issues. And they accepted them all, but we don't have a ruling yet. And so I think when we look at 911 and we look at Fukushima and realize that the dry cast storage at Fukushima survived. It didn't hurt anyone, it didn't explode. And the pools were annihilated and became missiles that I don't know what it's going to take for a regulatory body to just turn to energy with a four-time capacity pool on the roof of their building and say, get it out. Ray, your experience with the NRC. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, Dave does a great job of compiling these statistics, you know, kind of almost almost like baseball scores for you know, win, lose, whatever. And 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 they are and they are in, they are informative. My my experience, you know, is is more anecdotal. Okay, um, working. Uh, with NRC, uh, at, at one point in the in the late 1990s, after the scandal at Millstone and the scandal at, at Maine Yankee, where you know political forces were brought to play because these plants were in terrible shape, the NRC inspectors were complete completely didn't get it. Um, after that, NRC undertook a reform of the soil. Uh, but they set they set four goals in that in that reform, and it was uh, <clears throat> it was uh, increase public confidence, um, reduce regulatory burden, um, increase efficiency, and maintain um, safety. So you got you got. Three action items, three things that are dynamic, and they're moving. You're going to increase this. You're going to improve that. You're going to, but safety, you're going to maintain. And it's a clue. It's a clue that NRC, in, my, in 30 years that I've been dealing with, has never, ever, ever, ever admitted any mistake anywhere, except 
was a couple of just small occasions, and then it was it was cast in uh, actually in sports terms um, when when a millstone was just found to be riddled with safety defects, including you know operational managerial defects. Um, the NRC chairman at the time, uh, Dr. Shirley Jackson, said, "Well, we dropped the ball. We won't do it again." When Davis Bessie in, in Ohio um, re reacted with a hole in the head, um, it was found that it was found that the the, uh, the boric acid laced coolant in the reactor had seeped out uh, around the penetrations for the control rods um, and, and had concentrated because it was boiling away on top of the reactor, evaporating, and had eaten away a, a cantaloupe-sized hole right down through the, whatever it is, six or eight inches of steel, um, such that when the, the, the maintenance people were up on top of the reactor uh, during a refueling outage uh, and bumped into the control rod assemblies, uh, one of them actually rocked back and forth because all it was holding it was um, a, a liner, a weldman of stainless steel about 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. Just, that was never intended to be pressure um, bounded. It was just in there to prevent the reactor vessel from rusting from the inside. And the NRC's reaction to that was? Well, what um, the temporary chairman at the time, acting chairman, um, what the heck was his first name? Diaz. Niels. Niels. No wonder I can't say it. Scandinavian name and a Cuban name. Nils Diaz um, said, we dropped the ball. We won't do it again. <laughs> Those are the only two admissions I've ever gotten out of NRC sure. on, on any number of screw-ups. The thing about it is, well, here's what we found anecdotally. Is our okay? There are some good people, and they try hard. In the, in the year 1999, 2000, I served on, on uh, and it's Dave Lockbaum's fault, I served on the NRC's uh, evaluation panel for their new reactor oversight process. And in the middle of one of those sessions during, during our lunch break, you know, I had mid-level managers sidle up and say, you know, the work that you and Dave do is really important because you raise issues that we would not be allowed to raise. And because you raise them, on occasion, we have to deal with them. <laughs> Sir, well, this is, this is you know, it's a, it really is a mixed bag at NRC. It's a half convent, half cat house. And you, you got to understand, man, in this conversation, there's talk about uh, statistics on you know, life and death stuff. You, you can't be, you can't be real absolute about this stuff um, because your sources are are questioned. And when it comes to whether or not NRC is doing a good job, it's the same thing. It, it's really tough at, down at the street level to be absolute about whether they're doing a good job. Here's what I've observed though in general, is that every reform at NRC has led to less safety margin, to less conservative um, estimates, dose estimates, accident consequence estimates, to, you know, the, 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 the pointer, if you will, on the safety scale has only has only overall moved in one direction. There have been occasional bumps where they can prove this fact, but by and large, they have they have slid the marker in a direction of less conservation, less safety, more risk. And the the Fukushima fixes that they proposed, they had three Fukushima fixes. You know, they want to put uh, instrumentation in the spent fuel pools. They they want a uh, reliable vent, but not a filtered one. But you know, who knows what they're talking about? Um, and, and they and they want the plants prepared for extraordinary uh, externalities. Uh, you know, super tornadoes, I suppose. 
These are just itsy bitsy, teeny weeny, almost meaningless patches on systems that are extremely vulnerable. And, and if you take all of those wonderful risk statistics of like once in a billion years and all that, and just add up the number of BWR reactors out there in the world and the period of time in which they've been running, and then factor in the consequences when things do go wrong. Then, then it's all out there. I'm with the Massachusetts Peace Action, uh, and my question is concerning um, safety issues and the credibility uh, of these uh, safety questions. I mean, um, the I think the most eloquent people speaking uh, about the danger of nuclear power are the companies themselves, because they insist that they have to have protection from having to pay for any damages. I mean, the damages could be hundreds of billions, Chernobyl was hundreds of billions, uh, while um, presently I believe the price Anderson Act limits their liability to 112 million, which is peanuts compared to the billions. So it seems to me, um, as long as the companies insist that these things are so dangerous that they have to have this cap on liability, I don't believe them to be safe, because I take their, on that I believe them. <laughs> uh, so my question is, what is the chance of either getting rid of the price Anderson Act or at the very least, raising the uh, liability cap from 112 million to maybe 100 billion or something, they might have to buy insurance, but you can bet those insurance companies would be on their back and would make sure these things are much safer than they are. I've had numerous discussions on Capitol Hill trying to do either of those, and it's not very fruitful. The closest we came was in June of 2004, 2005, we were testifying before the House Energy, I think it was the House Energy and Commerce Committee about new reactors, and we pointed out the Price-Anderson barrier to safety improvements, and also in my panel was a vendor of the high-temperature gas cool reactor. Chairman Issa asked that individual, would his company opt out of Price-Anderson if they could, because he had contended that his reactor was safe enough it didn't need emergency planning and sirens and all that other stuff. He said he would. He thought his reactor was safe enough that it would be safer than other reactors. If, he, if nobody had Price Anderson, that would lead potential buyers to his plant because it was safer. That's the only person I've ever had that would, on, on the industry side, that would opt out of it. Uh, the company folded. It's not in the game anymore. But <laughs> so the closest I came was. But it's very difficult. There's not much interest on Capitol Hill on, on doing away with that. Part of the problem is that Price Anderson was just extended in 2005, so they don't have to revisit the issue for another, I think, 20 years before it comes back up. 15 years now, for those years ago. Yeah, Price Anderson covers uh, damages but it doesn't cover cleanup. So that's going to be a big task. year recertification process um, is, uh, well, they are looking at it, but they can only apply it to reactors they're currently building. How is it that we can make the process of applying lessons we've learned, because as you said, we do learn lessons, how can we make it so that we can apply these lessons in a more nimble fashion? One of the things we try to do to address that question, we've had some success on the commission level, but we don't have enough votes to make it happen, is to account for unresolved safety problems in the risk analysis. Plant owners have a risk analysis for their plants. What we'd like to do is put in their negative things, things that safety problems that aren't yet resolved. Those don't count in the risk studies. So we'd like to include them in the risk studies. That would give incentives to plant owners to resolve those problems more quickly if you looked across the fleet of reactors, the NRC could then have a better tally of where it should most directly apply its resources to achieve the greatest safety gains. Right now, they don't have a good accounting of where the safety problems are. So if we could get that in a, in a consolidated database where all the pluses and minuses are better tracked, we think the industry and the NRC would be better able to 
triage the problems, work off the most important ones fastest, not the ones that are just easiest to do. So that's our approach to try to address that, because it is the, it's the right thing to do. So that's a great question. We're trying to get it fixed. Uh, we had some success, or some hopeful, but we have some more homework to do to get there. Sure. Um, I'll try to pontificate if I can, uh, if I can. But by fair disclosure, I need to say that I spent uh, 20 years of my career uh, designing dry storage casks, getting them certified, getting them built and delivered, including at uh, the Millstone site, which you know very well. Speaking of the mic. On this panel, um, no. Uh, does anybody on the panel know uh, what the impact would be on the pools if you were to remove all of the fuel uh, that was five years or older, which has been recommended in your publications? What do you mean by, what would be the impact if you remove it? Yes, what would be the impact on the pool? There would be a number of impacts. First of all, by removing all of that fuel that's been out of the reactor for more than five years, you would replace it with water. So there'd be more water in the pool. So if the inventory was lost or cooling of the pool was lost, there'd be more water in there, more inertia to absorb the heat that's being produced by the spent fuel in the pool to give the operators more time to restore cooling or provide makeup for loss of inventory. In addition, one of the problems in densely packed spent fuel pools is criticality protection. In the old days, you used geometry to protect against criticality of the fuel at nuclear chain reaction in the spent fuel pool. When they went to high density racks, geometry no longer provided that protection, so they added a neutron absorber to prevent criticality in the spent fuel in the pools. Aging has shown that that neutron absorber doesn't last very long. We've had problems with gravity, calling it to fall to the bottom of the pools. It's dissolved into the water itself. If you remove the fuel, you got more water, you've got more space, you can spread out the, the surviving fuel, the remaining fuel, and reestablish geometry as protection against criticality. So you're dealing with the risk of meltdown of the fuel, of the fire of the fuel in the spent fuel pool. You're reducing the probability, you're reducing the consequences, and you're reducing the risk. You're also better protecting against the other casualty, which is a criticality in the spent fuel pool. So it's a, it's a, there's a lot to gain and very little to lose. I'd also add that if uh, the worst happened, you would have a far uh, less consequences because you would have uh, less radiation going out. Uh, the, the, most of what uh, you said uh, is correct in terms of uh, making uh, Im improvements. Uh, but uh, we need to, uh, to correct the fact that uh, at, uh, at Fukushima, the pools did not uh, contribute. They survived as well as the, the dry casks did on the site. And I'm a fan of dry casks. Uh, however, I've, I've run the numbers on Fukushima, and if, if we did what you suggested and removed all of the fuel that is uh, five years or older, it would have reduced the heat load in that pool by less than 6%, which is a trivial amount. It would not have impacted uh, the sequence of events that took place at all. If you take a look at the, uh, the, the heat loads in the pools in the United States, yes, they are densely packed, but the number of assemblies is far less important than the number of kilowatts of heat that are being generated. And removing the five-year-old and older fuel has almost no impact on that heat load because of the exponential decay. The heat load is driven almost entirely by the last discharge and you cannot remove that fuel to dry storage uh, for at least three to five years. So you can't really do a great deal of mitigation uh, by removing all of that fuel. I'd be happy to sell you the casks if you want to do it, but I don't think it's going to uh, make uh, that much of an improvement. You're right about the, the neutron absorbers. You're talking about Boroflex. That was another horrible mistake. Uh, that material is not being used in pools anymore. The materials that are being used now uh, are going to stand up. Uh, they're solid materials, and they're not going to fall apart the way the Boroflex did. I'd like to respond to that in a few cases, because I disagree with just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Fukushima, the spent fuel pools did survive, but you've got to recall that the reactor buildings blew up, which provided pathways for helicopters to drop water into the spent fuel pools and water cannons to shoot water from below. Hopefully in our reactors we don't blow up reactor buildings in order to provide the cooling makeups to the spent fuel pools. That's not the way to solve the problem. Second of all, yes, the heat load is, I do agree with this, the heat load is dominated by the fuel that's been coming out of the reactor in the last five years. But again, the fuel that you're taking out, I agree with that. That was the one thing I agreed with. 
and Fukushima did have a problem. I did agree with that also. The, but taking out the older fuel, you're, again, you're replacing it with water. Fukushima only had about one reactor core's worth of fuel. That's far less than reactors in the United States have. The average reactor in the United States, according to the NRC, has more than three times as much fuel in the spent fuel pool. So it's, there are a number of reasons that Fukushima's lessons learned, unless you design the plants to blow up the reactor buildings, can't be attributed to reactors in the United States. In addition, even if you're absolutely true that the heat load isn't changed at all, let's say it doesn't change at all, which isn't true, but let's say that. I'll, I'll give it away. It doesn't change at all. There's no change at all. Removing the fuel out of the pool reduces the consequences, as Mary said. If, we, if there is a problem, the fact that there's fewer fuel assemblies in the pool means that the radioactive cloud is much, much smaller. That's the consequence part of the risk equation. Probability may be the same. I think it improves that you reduce the probability. But let's fix it for a moment. You're significantly reducing the consequences. When you multiply those together, you significantly reduce the risk. So I'll buy a lot of your cast if the nuclear waste fund will be available to better protect Americans. But they, they, they said that there's supposed to be 10, 10 years of water in those fuel in the pools in Fukushima. It's supposed to be 10. I think it's 30 some odd, 40 feet of water. And one of the pools has 60 centimeters, which is about two feet. That's the that's supposedly the latest we above the top of the fuel. Above the back top of the fuel. I, I didn't hear the question, there's about 45 feet of water. In the supposedly, there's supposed to be like 45. But, but you're doing uh, it right, there's 45 feet in there. Uh, but I heard, I, I, above the fuel. There's got to be at least 22 feet above the, the fuel in order to provide fuel. I heard that in one, I'm just asking a question. I understand this. I read it a few days ago that one of the meetings might be just 60 wow. centimeters. Uh, what do you think? That, that there may be just 60 centimeters of water above the, uh, the uh, spent fuel pool of one of the reactors. I, I haven't seen that. But no. Okay. Um, From your perspective on the, on the question of uh, emptying the spent fuel pools uh, to the degree possible, um, and, and that is, I think that by and large, most of these arguments are informed by the uh, assumption that spent fuel pools are going to leak and that water can be replaced and so on. And, um, you know, we have, we have two reactors that we're talking about here tonight, both Pilgrim and uh, Vermont Yankee, which are Fukushima-style reactors in the sense that the spent fuel pool uh, is located some 80 feet up in the air. Um, next to the outside wall of the, of the reactor. Um, NRC did a study, and I, and I helped, I'm glad to say, um, back in the year 2000, Nurate 1738, in which they decided that the, the outside walls of the uh, reactor building would, uh, and that is also what is called a secondary containment, would, would present no substantial obstacle to aircraft penetration. Um, the, the question of seismic um, durability came up. Um, NRC has a uh, consultant in, Dr. Robert P. Kennedy, attachment three to NRAC 1738. He talks about Vermont Yankees uh, spent fuel pool failure modes. And he says the gross structural Failure mode would be a, an out-of-plane shear failure of the pool floor slab. Okay, got that? Okay. This is a big opening. But, but Dr. Kennedy goes further. And he says possibly the floor would drop out. That's a 40 by 40 by 40, or 40 by 40 foot hole. Um, you're not going to replace the water. In fact, you're not going to get anywhere near the reactor should something like that happen because of the, because there'd be no shielding whatsoever for the radioactive material. At Vermont Yankee, when loading the dry casks, the crane 
brakes fail. Fortunately, the, the cast was over the loading deck, not over the spent fuel pool itself, and the brakes didn't grossly fail, but they failed to the point that the cast descended, whether uh, the operators wanted it to or not, down to the loading deck. Um, and they were very proud that that accident happened when the cast was not over the pool. We found out a few days later that what they had forgotten to do was to put the travel limiters on the crane that would automatically prevent it from going over the pool once it was loaded and lifted. NRC's analysis on this says that that depth of water in the pool would not substantially slow down that cask, 100 ton cask, where it dropped. Now that puppy is 11 feet in diameter and would punch an 11 foot diameter hole in the bottom of the pool. So the deal is, if you can take the fuel out and put it in cask where you have a limited number of assemblies in each cask all surrounded by a couple of inches of steel and 20 inches of concrete, there's no accident that we can envision where there would be a significant propagation of that accident from cast to cast to cast. But an accident in the spent fuel pool, propagation would be through, potentially, to whatever fuel was in there, up to a few thousand assemblies. I know it seems like we know all these problems in the past of all these, and now we're building two new ones down in, um, what's it, Jenkinsville, South Carolina. The hole's already been dug for that. And um, I was curious how they, with all this history of problems with it, that they got that to pass down in South Carolina. What is it? And they say it's supposed to be something. I haven't read much on it lately. But they were saying that, oh, it's going to be safer and this and that and the other thing. And it's been years since we've had a nuclear power plant built in this country. How did that one slip in? That's all I need to know. <laughs> I know it's falling on deaf ears with the NRC. I know. Well, when we were discussing this 10 years ago with Energy Management, Energy owned both Dilberman, Vermont and Yankee now, and we were talking about the possibility of building new plants. And what the manager said to me was, they're going to be built, and they're going to be built in the South. They had, they had never experienced the uh, kind of reception that they got here in New England. <laughs> South, the South has been amenable to it. One comment by one energy manager was, well, if you come for, from where we come from, down in Chemical Alley, nuclear looks pretty good. And uh, most certainly the experience uh, on the relicensing front uh, has, is nothing like anybody's seen. Uh, between Celebrum, Vermont, starting up at Seabrook, uh, New York Attorney General at Indian Point, uh, I think the message has gotten out, uh, no, don't go west, go south. Uh, it's a matter of money. Nuclear renaissance, matter of money, is that going to happen here? What? I think there's already been a nuclear renaissance revival, which is an easier word for me to pronounce, in the United States. In that if you look at the 104 reactors we have in the United States, they've basically been in operation since uh, 1996. No new reactors have joined the fleet since then. If you look at their output since that time, it's significant. I think it's equivalent to 15 or 16 new reactors of 1,000 megawatts electric each. They've achieved that increased production by increasing the capacity factor, how much of the time the plants run. And they've also increased that, that increase in output by increasing the power levels of which they operate, the plants operate. So those 15 or 16 virtual new reactors has been the nuclear renaissance that I think we've seen in the United States. The downside for the industry from that success is it pushed back the need for replacement electricity. So it's difficult to justify building a new plant when you run the existing plants for a longer period of time at higher power levels. So if they hadn't been so successful renewing the licenses, improving the output from the plants, 
would have hastened the need for replacement power of either nuclear or non-nuclear sources. But that success essentially pushed off the need for new reactors and, and killed or crippled, slowed down, impaired the, the nuclear renaissance of new reactors in the United States. Sir. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if it's because we're at MIT, um, but so far we've been focusing almost entirely on sort of the technical aspects of nuclear energy, which are intriguing, to say the least. Um, but um, I, I would just uh, ask uh, a question about uh, emergency planning and um, evacuation planning, that sort of thing. Um, I, I, came, I live on Cape Cod. Um, all of Cape Cod is within about 35 miles of Pilgrim. At Fukushima, when Fukushima happened, um, the NRC advised all Americans within 50 miles to, to leave. Um, and yet, uh, on Cape Cod, there is no uh, radiological emergency plan whatsoever, known as zero zip. Um, the only, uh, only, there is a plan, however, for livestock on Cape Cod um, to feed its stored hay. Um, and there is also the uh, plan for the 10-mile zone includes closing both bridges on Cape Cod so that people um, have to stay there. Um, so I guess uh, my question is kind of vague, but I, I'd just like to hear about, you know, what has been done since Fukushima to increase um, um, uh, radiological emergency planning. Thank you. Well, I can answer that question and, and also circle back to the question uh, Bruce asked earlier about NRC's receptiveness. In summer of last year, UCSD issued a report on what we thought the lessons learned from Fukushima were. And one of the recommendations, one of the key recommendations was we need to revisit emergency planning and look at site-specific, don't draw, don't draw an arbitrary boundary of 5 miles, 10 miles, 20 miles. Each site is unique. If, if there's a large population center one mile further past wherever you draw the line, that's not right. So what we recommended was you look at each site, what its particular characteristics were, and make sure that the people around that site were adequately protected. The receptiveness, the NRC agreed that that was an issue warranting additional consideration and added it to their list. That's one of the 34. With help from people in this room and elsewhere, we can help the NRC decide that they do need to change that and go beyond 10 miles and not maintain the status quo. So it's a work in progress with your help and others. We can get that done right. And so we're hopeful we'll get that outcome. It's going to take some more work. Look, it's, it's an issue. The, the good news is the NRC didn't just reject it outright. So it's on the table. Our work is to keep it on the table so that it comes to the right outcome. And I think also if there is uh, pressure on the states, because this is one area that the state has some authority. The states can put in place uh, emergency plans that are, as long as they're more conservative than those required by the federal government and FEMA in their guidance. Uh, quite clearly, Massachusetts, as it was with potassium iodide, which is another key issue in planning, uh, took a lead. And it was a, a message that has gone across all, to a lot of other states. And so I think it would be a double play. Pressure on the NRC and at the same time pressure on our state to move forward as it should and the two will react with one another. We should say that you need to search scientists as an effort for the 10 states, I believe, to put pressure for citizens to go to the state legislators and, and, and talk about these issues. I'm going to take one more question and then I'm going to give each person your Sun is a great sanitizer. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is your feeling about the adequacy and independence, A, of congressional oversight? And is it likely to be different under the Democrats than under the Republicans? Secondly, what about the independence and uh, accuracy of the media coverage of these issues? And anticipating your answers, is this time for citizen and social control of the industry rather than the assumption we've been going on, which is let's say, make the NRC work better. Is it time for citizens to sit in oversight of this technology? 
We have some serious issues um, in order to take more control. And one of them is that uh, the industry has made real progress legally in limiting the access to real data and real information from the plant. The NRC now, and it's part of technology, and it's the future, and it's going to be the way it is. But the NRC now accesses all online plant information and data through Centrex, the computer access program. Because they don't own the data, means they, 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 that it's not in the public domain, and that they can't share with the public what it is that they're finding. So we've had to pursue FOIAs to get information that's largely been dependent on communication between people in memos or reports that are internal reports. But it is limiting our ability to have, and you know, the NRC is speaking all the time about transparency, but in reality, this, uh, you know, we have scientists in the room who want to assess for themselves and, and for us, with a new problem at Seabrook, we have an expert, and we cannot provide him a lot of the raw data for him to assess. So this is a real problem, and uh, what we find over and over again is that the industry continues to put pressure legally on uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission through their legal people to uh, have more propriety. So that's one way that it's getting hard to know the truth. One of the things that um, is very burdensome in terms of the regulatory process, and we need to figure this out, Seabrook right now has 920 corrective actions backlog. So if you think about plant deficiencies and operational issues that sometimes are definitely the initiative of the industry, they see something wrong, and they put it in the corrective action program, largely it comes from the NRC. There is no possible way that anybody can, can um, know in any detail 920 of these situations and know their, their status, and whether they're closed properly, there, there aren't enough staff at the NRC to do this work. And so a lot of it is the um, responsibility of the operators to close them. And they may be closing the same corrective action over and over again. We don't know. The other thing that we're seeing so often is <coughs> an exception to a regulation, an exception to a rule. There are alternatives to the rules. And I throw all these by Dave Lockbaum when they happen at Seabrook because he has the insight and judgment um, to know whether this is a reasonable alternative, that the plant is actually asking for a design change that is in reason. But when you put it all together, when you put all the, the performance, the corrective actions, the exceptions to the rules, the alternatives, um, you, you're no longer really working the way the plant was designed. And if there's a cause and effect between one change that's been allowed, you've made an allowance here, you've increased the pressure there, the cause and effect, I think, is, is very hard to track, both from the regulator and the industry, from the engineers of the plant. And so, you know, these are design changes and issues that I, I think are, are potentially the real safety issue. And I think we need to look at it more deeply. To so address some things of the agency, they were instrumental in identifying the millstone problems that led to that plant being turned around and changes to the NRC's oversight regime as well. So there's been a lot of reports over the years. In recent years, the NRC's inspector general has not kept up that pace due to some changes and some other things. What we've talked to Congress about to deal with low probability, high consequence events like NASA with the shuttle problems, Deepwater Horizon, is increasing the funding for the inspector generals. Those are the agency's consciences, if you will, that help them 
help Congress, since they report their results to the Congress, to see whether that agency is really fulfilling its mission to protect the American public, not just the NRC, but across the board. We've recently interested the, the United States Government Accountability Office in this, looking into what the pluses and minuses of that recommendation are. That study we think will be started soon, about sometime next year will be reported to Congress. Then the role is to get the Congress to implement the recommendations made by GAO. But I think, I think we've got a couple steps down the right path. I hope we'll get to that end. And I think that will address some of what the first part of your question was. I'm going to talk about the media just for very briefly here, because my judgment is harsher than David's, and that is, I mean, nuclear issues are very dirty. Microphone. Intensely, the nuclear issues are, are very dirty. They're intensely in, in complex. Um, and they're hard to communicate, not just to the general public, but to the, your, your editors and producers, and sell them on the idea of doing a story, because they've got to commit a lot of resources to doing those stories. M media is mostly reactive, right? That's the way we just kind of are, you know? And, and so to do a story looking out, it's not that we don't know these issues, or, but to, to look at it is very difficult. Very difficult to sell inside the organization, very difficult to communicate to the public in general. And they're very expensive, as they say. I mean, if you listen to the, uh, the marketplace, I just heard it the other day, which is a pretty darn good public radio show, I think, but uh, their sponsorship is by the Nuclear Energy Institute, which is brand new. You know, so if you've got a concern about public radio, I'd suggest you put your money where our mouths are and, and do something about that. So, uh, Ray, you want to wrap up here with a couple of things, Mary, uh, Debbie, some round finish ideas here? Because we, we haven't talked about things like tritium, we haven't talked about, you know, Vermont and the, the legal issues involved there. I mean, there's so much here, obviously. So we, but think, think nothing of it. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, there's a it lot is. going on. This goes to this question that was raised up here uh, with respect to congressional oversight. Peter Bradford, who's a former NRC commissioner, said there are three parties uh, in control in Washington. There's you know, Republicans, Democrats, and a nuclear party. And a nuclear party is really an across-the-aisle party. You, you can find a few anti-nuclear uh, congressional persons who are outspoken and they and they're concerned for nuclear safety. But there's a raft of them that are adamantly pro-nuclear, um, they're vociferous, um, they really do good work for their uh, donor supporters um, on, on pushing nuclear issues. And um, most recently in the Vermont Yankee uh, relicensing, we had um, Jeff Bingman, uh, we, had a, we had a crew, and they happened to be Republicans at that time, um, that wrote to the NRC, and they were totally indignant because this licensing was dragging on, and what was wrong with the NRC? You know, the fact is that we had, we had real technical issues that had to be resolved, and, um, you know, NRC put their foot on the accelerator, and uh, could have been, it was done and over with. Uh, in fact, on the eve of Fukushima, um, that was meaningful to us. Um, well, it is what it is. Um, we, we had, at, at Maine Yankee, we had a debate over um, residual radiation levels after the cleanup. And EPA had recommendations of 15 exposure units a year, and, and NRC had a rule that allowed 25, and we were pushing 10 because it had been done in other states, and why not? Um, but the EPA guys, in this big debate we had, they, they put on a really wimpy performance. And then afterward, they said to me, we're getting on a plane tonight. And we're going to Washington. And we're going to be appearing before Senator Domenici's committee. He's a, 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 a pro-nuclear advocate. And he is controlling our budget. <gasps> And he has threatened to chop it in half if we don't get in line. It was that simple. So, you know, I, I, I guess in the big dialogues we have, and we're famous for them here in New England, you know, the town meetings, it's the time that we really need to speak to our representatives about, you know, what our sentiments are on this. Um, you know, it, it's clear they haven't gotten the message from the marketplace. Nuclear energy is a marketplace dog. 
Uh, How many millions did N NEI use for PR? Was it like eight million? Oh, I you know I I don't know, but the money goes across the arc. Um, oh, wait, sorry. Energy Energy Corporation, which is the second largest nuclear operator in the country, uh, was a major donor for Hillary Clinton's uh, primary campaign, and Exelon, which is the largest, um, was the biggest supporter of Obama that you could find. And uh, you know, so it's. Money is evenly distributed. The influence is, is extremely powerful, and I, and, I, and I think really the only real answer is to talk it out. This meeting's perfect in that respect. I are in smaller communities where our nuclear plants were not in Boston or Cambridge. And um, resources are limited, and, and we don't have investigative reporters. Um, they're assigned rapidly to try to get wrap their arms around an issue. And we find that when we give them a list of experts to tap, they're not comfortable enough because it's a technical area and they don't have the investigative reporter base to feel that comfortable with the comment that's going to be given to them. Can they vet this? But they don't call Dave Lockbaum or Arnie Gunderson or an expert. And we keep putting it out there, and they don't. So what happens is the story gets told in very broad terms. They ask for a comment from the industry. The PR guy makes a, um, you know, an overall statement of assurance. And the last quote of the article always is from the plan. And it leaves you with, you know, the advocacy group says, but the plan says, don't worry, you can sleep tonight. And it always sort of ends on that note. And so it's almost like a format is that, you know, if we are asked for comment, the industry always seems to have the last word and it's one of the chances and not a, of any challenge to the technical issue at hand. Let me just say, it, it takes me um, 100 hours on average to do one minute of investigative reporting. So it's expensive. It just is. I mean, it, it, it's, and the other thing is about this question of balance, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very weird, you know, um, because it's like saying, well, the world is round, on, they say it's round, and they say it's flat, so it must be oval. You know, it's like as if, and, and, and it's, and it's, and if you look at the way journalism is just going to be driven today, it's, it's, it's that, it's that. We got an oval world. But that's neither here nor there. Last words, because I've really enjoyed this. Um, Ray, Deb, Mary, David, you got a last word? Yeah, I started out by talking about three things we learned over 35 years. I want to talk about a fourth thing we learned. One is I need to listen to these people. Listening to Ray talk about three parties. We also think there's a three-party involved, but it's a little bit different than Ray's. We look at the operating licenses the NRC issues to, to nuclear power plants and the regulations that the NRC establishes as being three-party contracts between the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the plant owners, and the public. That contract protects the plant owners from the NRC requiring more stringent and often more costly measures than are those established by the regulations and the operating licenses. By the same token, that contract should protect the public from the NRC accepting less than the safety levels defined by the regulations. That's what upsets us when we see 47 reactors that don't meet fire protection regulations for three decades, seismic issues that are known to be greater than the plants are designed for but nothing being done for. We think the NRC is breaching its contract with the American public. We don't see many examples of the NRC requiring more than this, the regulations require, so the NRC needs to also Stop cheating the American public by accepting less. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Great way to talk. Mary, call it. Mary, you got one thing to say. Hang on. Yes. Um, I respect Barney Frank a great deal. He had a huge amount to say, as always. Uh, when he was interviewed and what he learned. He was asked the question of 
the influence of a huge and growing uh, amount of money on decision making. And he said, you bet, it's there, it's growing daily. However, we all have to be elected. And so therefore, if our constituents are putting a lot of pressure on us, that will outweigh the amount of money any day. And so again, I think the public rightfully, and certainly all of us have gone through it, how many more days should we beat our heads against the wall for what? Should we shred our documents and reports before we mail them or not? Will it even make a difference? It does make a difference. And if people give up, which I'm afraid the energy which is developing around Pilgrim by the help of the Union Concerned Scientists, by the focus of the media during license renewal, I'm afraid that some will say, well, look what happened. They had uh, ongoing litigation, they played by the rules, they had their experts, they spent a freaking personal fortune on it, and then, huh, we're tired of it. We have decided energy one, and so we're all taking our ball and going home. Okay, that's what they're telling the commissioners to do. I trust they won't do it. If, God forbid, that happens, we too have to go into federal court. I hope the public understands that doesn't erase the safety concerns. That doesn't mean you're powerless. You're only powerless if you say, or refuse to say, I'm not going to the back of the bus. That you keep active, you keep educating the media, you have to do a lot of work for them. You keep educating new legislators. They haven't got a cloak. And make sure that it becomes an important issue which they know they have to get into because their constituents are getting into it. The only way we will see true action is by the hard work of the real experts like Dave Bachbaum, but also of the people like myself who, and like you and you and you who are sitting in this audience, to take the time for your own personal safety. Thank you very much.